Hello, everyone. What happens when a top employment lawyer falls off the wagon? Can it even be possible? I mean, a top employment lawyer, someone that is like in, in society, he's top in society, well-respected, well-loved, doing really, really well in his career, and then something happens. Today, I have Kevin Heyer with me as my guest, and we've got a very exciting, well, exciting as in fast-paced story, um, all about Kevin and how he fell off the wagon. But I'll let Kevin explain all those things. Hello, Kevin. Good morning. How are you, Karina? I'm awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, let's have a bit of a background. Tell us about who Kevin was or who, uh, what did Kevin do? Who's Kevin? Who's Kevin? Well, Kevin is many things. He's a son, he's a brother, he's an attorney, and he's a recovering methamphetamine addict. Um, I am 42 years old. I live outside of Philadelphia. Um, I'm an employment lawyer by my background. I went to Penn State University for my undergraduate work and my law degree at the University of Baltimore. And I've always prided myself in using my gifts as an attorney to help other people, and particularly in the workplace setting, you know, um, mm -hmm. correcting injustices, helping companies stay strong so they can continue to employ people. But when something happens that's not right, making it right for the employee. Um, so that's who I am as a person professionally. As I am as an individual, you know, I've always had a sense of, of social justice. You know, um, I happen to be gay, so I have a sensitivity to that. Um, you know, I grew up in a family where I was blessed to have two parents that were, were married and had some financial stability. So I always grew up with a sense of those who have have an obligation to give more. OK, mm -hmm. more is expected. Mm -hmm. of you. you know, I yes, had a faith yes. in growing up. Yes. Um, and in my story, that that plays into this quite a bit. Um, you know, we work even in active addiction. One of the things I'm most proud of, I have many flaws in this world. But I like to think I never lost my moral compass in, in active addiction. And I'll talk to you about that specifically when we get there. Well, uh, that's Kevin. very uh, sorry, Kevin. It's very interesting because um you have the perfect you have the, the perfect background, right? Beautiful parents, loving parents, loving environment, um, a a career that you're doing really well, successful. So that's just does it doesn't fit with the stereotype, and we will be talking about stereotypes in a minute. But we just I'm just for the question right now in the stereotype of what happened. So, what happened? What happened that day, or what happened to just destroy this for you? So, so what, what had happened was I was 39 when I first tried meth. Up until then, I had smoked weed maybe a couple times. I was a goody-goody overachiever from the suburbs. <laughs> you know, I really, I mean, funny, but I'm making a point. Like I was, anyone who knew me before will validate this statement that this was very out of character. Um, mm -hmm. I was for the first time after a long time. Um, I was staring 40 in the face, dangerously close to 40, as I put it. Um, you know, I had a satisfying career, but it wasn't quite where I had pictured it being. Um, yes. Again, I'm happy about being single for the first time in many years. Um, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. Um, and that mistake was I tried meth. What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Yes. Why did you try meth? I mean, okay, you, you said you were 39 going on to 40. Um, and all oh, goody goody, and, and we we'll we'll refer. I did um, chat to your mother, and she said you were an, a, like the perfect child, right? Um, oh, I'll and the link will be at the bottom in the description box, just to say. So, what happened? What happened on that day to make you try meth? I mean, who does that, and why did you do it? <laughs> I did. Um... I think in the stresses of facing midlife, I mean, this is what this was, was effectively an early midlife crisis. I like to call it early. Give me that one. <laughs> that 39 <laughs> is quite early midlife. Like 40 um, is seriously young, but okay, just as a button. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for throwing me that one. Um, <laughs> I, what happened was I was picturing where I thought I would be, where right. I wanted to be, and in the stresses of, of finding myself, I, I made a mistake. You know, we're, we're all human. We're all fallible. And I thought that trying meth would make me more productive at work. You know, I was proud of my professional successes. I worked in a large law firm. 
you know, mm-hmm. where you have to bill hours. And I just thought in a very misguided way that this might be be a vehicle to get where I wanted to go and then do more good. You know, I've always had that sense, as I said, of, of, of social justice and a social conscience and many flaws for sure. I, I, I have them, but I, I always prided myself in that. And I always wanted that to be my legacy. Yes, and I think in yes. a very twisted way, and it was inaccurate um, and clearly unsuccessful effort because it only took <laughs> weeks for me to be fired over this. Um, but again, that's part of my story. I thought that it would help me get to to that place faster, and, and it, it did not. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> so was it because you were feeling like you you weren't um, you were losing your productivity, or were you just trying to push it because it was a midlife crisis, which is really um, very young to have a midlife crisis, uh, or, or or what was it really? Can you pinpoint what it was exactly that? Because why didn't you try it a few years before or um, a few years later? Why did you try it at that moment? That's a great question. I think that in the in that moment in time where I was trying to find myself, you know, as I put it, I'm being funny, but it was true. You know, I was dangerously close to 40, staring it down. I was struggling with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had this image of where I would be at 40 and I wasn't there Mm -hmm. and had things to be grateful for, you know, I was still, um, I was greedy. That's one of my flaws. You know, I I've learned in recovery to be grateful for a lot of things. And for as much as I had, there were still things I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And yes, in that misguided moment in that stress, you know, I looked back at my life for one and saying, you know, I've always done the right thing. You know, I started college at 16, actually. You know, I moved on to Penn State after two years going to college and high school. You know, oh, I had nice. always done the right thing. Okay, mm-hmm. Not that I made mistakes, but, you know, I went to college and I worked hard. I graduated with close to a 4.0. You know, then I went on to law school, worked hard there, got a good job. You know, I did everything that was expected of me. And I think I felt like at that moment, well, I wasn't thinking in that instance, hey, someday I'm going to give an interview about this. Um, <laughs> a little bit of a, I don't want to say screw it, but throw caution to the wind. I had been a good kid. I had done all the things I was supposed to do. Yes. I wasn't where I was at. And, you know, I I, I made a mistake. You know, the, the, the neurons in my mind rationalized in that moment trying methamphetamine, and I got addicted right away. I believe I was addicted the first time. Okay, so it's it's quite interesting to see. For me, all of my, almost um, I just see this this person now. For for some really strange reason, I see the picture of the, the, there's there's you know the fool's journey where you have the fool is at the beginning of the journey, right, where he just jumps off that cliff. Um, and I suppose you never, you never had you. It was almost like a teenage rebellion. That's what it looks like to me. That you yeah. never had in your teens, right? There's um, a lot of truth to that. So, Some of my have drawn that analogy. Um, yes. And you have to have that at some point. So you just chose meth. So what happened? So you had you took the, you took it once, and how did you feel? The first time. Uh, sure. No, I mean, meth is certainly, it's an evil, evil drug. I'd say if the devil could create a drug, it would be that because it is man-made and it, it messes with your mind in such an evil way. Um, you know, it, it, it gives you a false sense of confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives you a false sense of well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's an aphrodisiac. It has a lot of appeal in a, in a very prurient way, in a selfish way. You know, I wanted to, I want to impress people. Um, and it, it gave me that confidence I was lacking in that moment. And it was inaccurate, clearly. Yes. But yes. it gave me a moment in time that thought, okay, this is what I need to get to where I want to be. And then I'll stop doing it. Okay. Um, but of course, that's not how addiction works. And we'll talk about that in this podcast. Um, but that's how it felt. It's a euphoria. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be real with your viewers, yes. of course. Yes. What people do, yes. it's one hell of a high, but it will also wreck your life in every other way. Okay. So I'm not romanticizing it at all. I want to be clear on that. That's the evil of drugs yes. is that they give you that momentary pleasure that then sets in motion the rest of your life to potentially blow up catastrophically. Mm-hmm. And you know, in addition and to that, is, yeah, how soon do you get off that train towards jails, institutions, or death, yes. which is what yes. they say in recovery is what's going to happen to addiction if it's not arrested. 
no pun intended with the jails part, but if it's it not stopped, and it's true, that's where it will end. You'll die, you'll end up in an institution, or you'll be incarcerated. Mm. And None of which good. are feeling. Yeah, and especially with meth that, you know, half the time there's so much, you don't even know what's inside that drug. So it just messes with your head. Um, and, yes. and, yes, they do call it the devil's, whatever they call it, the devil's drug or Satan's or whatever the, it's called. The psychotic nature of methamphetamine is what was hardest for me, the paranoia. And I'm, I'll be very open with your with your viewers about some of that. Um, you sense danger everywhere. OK, yes. and the slightest things will make you put together a narrative that plays on your biggest fears. OK, that's from the evil of drugs. So whatever your biggest fear is with methamphetamine, it will play that out in your mind. And it will take things that really did happen and then weave them into this story that you believe with all certainty is accurate. No one is going to convince you otherwise. Mm. And then you are doing things in response to that, because it's no different than I'm thinking right now. I do things in response to my you know, cognition, but now they're at least thought out, they're sober thoughts. Yes, the thing yes. Meth. And then that's just makes your life worse because you're pushing people. You know, you're making those decisions that then result in jails, institutions, or death. Yes. So tell me what happened after that. So you took your first hit thinking that you were going to just like excel your, your progress to wherever you wanted to be. Um, what happened after that? So how quickly did you spiral out of control? Sure. Um, it took eight weeks from the first time I tried it to being let go from my job, um, being called into the managing partner's office and being told, you know, I don't care where you go, but you can't stay here. Not quite <laughs> that. I mean, they were very kind to me. They were very kind yes, to me. Yes. I explained, I did admit what happened. Um, but, you know, you still have to be responsible for your actions. And, and I wasn't in any place to work at that time, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I was in denial. So I yes. went it, starting into COVID, which was also part of my story, you know, so it was easy to hide, you know, and, and it, it just became more and more comfortable. Uh, it's sort of like trying on a new pair of shoes. The first time you try it, you might like it, but it's a little uncomfortable. But after you wear it a couple times, it just becomes easier and easier. And before you know it, you're just wearing it. Yes. That's the yes. that I've, I've, I've made with meth. Um, it reached a point where I just thought, oh, well, well, never thought this would happen. But you no, know, it's what it is. I'm just doing crystal meth. That's how powerful that drug was. And right. even the absurdity of that statement. You know, here I was, an attorney. I was on some boards of directors. You know, I. And I had many flaws, but I was I, I was a contributing member of society. Mm -hmm. And I just slowly began to normalize what was clearly a very, very unhealthy, you know, behavior. Yeah. So and, easy. And that's addiction, though. That's addiction. So, so tell us happened. tell us a bit about the sordid side of it. So how did you get it in the first place? And how did you find it after that? And was it really as sordid as um, we can I, imagine it to be? I had I had been casually dating somebody who had mentioned that he had access to it, um, which was a temptation to me. And I um I I, I pursued it, you know. Um mm -hmm. method kind of thing that although we don't talk about it a lot because there is such a judgmental association, which I'm not necessarily knocking. I mean, it's bad, bad stuff. Yes, but yes. at the same time, that judgment can also, there's a healthy judgment and an unhealthy judgment. Mm -hmm. um, it's It can be found. So the bottom line is I pursued that. Um, and then I liked it so much, I just sort of found ways to pursue it. it meth is the kind of thing, if you're looking for it, you can find it. it you know? yeah, Even if you don't travel in those circles. Um, and I, I saw a whole different world. I like to say that I felt like a war correspondent for those two years that I was addicted to methamphetamine. I had been taken from, you know, an otherwise fairly innocent, sheltered, naive place mm -hmm. to one of the seediest <laughs> subcultures you can imagine. OK, I mean, yeah. the drug culture itself is dysfunctional, but methamphetamine has a certain particular character to it because of the psychological problems that go with it, mm -hmm. um, the criminality that surrounds it. I mean, all, mm -hmm. all drugs you know, can be illegal, but when I say criminality, um, 
there's a lot of violence that goes with methamphetamine, theft. Um, it's, it's just bad, bad stuff. Sexual assault because of the sexual association with it. It's bad, bad stuff. And I observed, you know, um, the, the sexual manipulation of young adults, you know, prostitution. OK, mm-hmm. and engage, but I saw it, you know, it, drugs have such a ripple effect yes. on, on yes. our society. You know, and when, when you've been kicked out of your home because your parents and family don't understand what you're doing, you take comfort in other people who do. Well, those other people are still stealing from you because they're in an equally dysfunctional place. You know, and yes. then you work with what you have, and that's how people end up on the street. Mm-hmm. So what I would say is that when you see that person panhandling, they may have started out a very, very different image. You know, yes. and by the grace of God, you know, I'm not there. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is to try to give something back because I was blessed to have the the privilege to not end there because I would have had I not had my family to fall back on. Mm, yes, you were lucky there. Um, I just want to go back um, just out of pure interest now, um, just to show a bit about the dynamics within a, a relationship. Uh, you 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 were in this relationship with this man, this person, um, and. Uh, how did the relationship end up did, with you both using, um, did it actually no. just explode or did you just support each other and carry on using together? Well, actually, he had not been using it. I used it after we broke up because I was lost. So my former partner was was not involved in drugs in any way. Okay. Um, I was, I'm telling you the, the truth in the most blunt way. I was, I was feeling lost. You know, I was 39 years old. I was struggling with turning 40. I was single for the first time. I didn't like that. I was, I was trying to find purpose. I was trying to find who Kevin Heyer was on a more visceral level. Sure, I had a good career, but that's not everything. Okay. Mm, mm, and it wasn't quite where I pictured it being. You know, I saw my parents aging. Um you know, I just, I was lost. For whatever mysterious reason the universe played out as it did, I found myself trying to find an identity. And in that moment, you know, I, I, tr- I tried that. And I've observed relationships where both people have addictions and it's chaos. I mean, addiction yes. by definition is chaos. Yes. Some people yes. refer to the chaos of addiction. Yes. You know, um, I, I, I'd say it is you're always trying to keep one, mm. it's like whack a mole. OK, it's like you're always trying to keep to get stay on top of something, because by the inherent nature of addiction, you're not on top of your game. You know, some people last a little longer mm-hmm. and some people have more privilege that might help them, you know, but it, it's 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 a savage way to live because it's a cycle. And, you know, how many times I say, you know, I used to say never again, never again, never again, you know, or yeah. bargaining with God. OK, please, like, like, God, don't let this happen again. And in that moment, you believe it. Mm-hmm. And then you don't take the right steps, the, the tape is going to replay and then you'll start to miss it again. And then and each time you become a little more damaged from it because addiction is a progressive disease. Yes, yes. Again, it will end in, you know, there are exceptions to everything. But I think it's a fair statement to make that it will end in jails, institutions or death if you don't arrest, you know, if you don't stop the addiction. And that's the, the good news is there is hope. You know, you, you can, you can beat addiction. You know, I'm speaking to someone who has, and meth is arguably one of the most, if not the most addictive drugs. Yes, because nothing, yes. releases more, nothing releases more dopamine than methamphetamine does. <laughs> okay, it's four times as strong as cocaine. Well, that's part of the evil of it. It, it gives right. you a high, but it will also screw your life up in every other way. Yes. You know, from, from God's mouth to your ears, it will. Yes. Nothing good comes from it. Yes. So tell us. Okay. So you, after eight weeks, you were you were um, you were let go, right? They said, "Well, hey, Kevin, this isn't working, and you need to go." What happened then? Did you just fall straight into the um, more addiction and and just like throw yourself into the myth, or did you see say, "Hey, what's going on here? I need to change my life." For, 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 for a hot minute, I think my head may have been there. But again, the power of addiction is so strong that no, I just sat there and I, I had the ability to not work for a minute and I just fell further into addiction. And, and that's some of the evil of addictions that changes the brain chemistry. Yes, so you yes. start to, again, it's not just normalizing use of the drugs. 
it's all the other decisions you make that then create a ripple effect. And I give an example of something. Mm -hmm. Now, it was performance, not conduct. I would have been eligible for unemployment benefits. Yes, okay, yes. Employment, I mean, I certainly know how to go get it. It took me two and a half months to even apply. Yes. That's the power of that drug. I wasn't doing anything. I was sitting around. That's all I did. You know, and that's where I also say to people, you know, and, and again, I'm trying to be real with your, your viewers. This is where money doesn't always buy happiness because I had a couple of dollars to buy it just reinforced the addiction faster. Yes. And drug dealers will tell you what you can afford to buy until they think you're a liability to them. You know, and I learned a lot about that culture. You asked about the sordid nature. You know, um, I mean, I can say, I'll tell you this. Most lower level drug dealers, they don't like drug dealers. Okay. Nobody grows up saying, hey, I want to be selling methamphetamine on the street corner, you know, right. in Philadelphia when yes. I grow up. Okay. Yes. Yes. They're doing it. They're, okay. Um, and, you know, I'm not trying to get into the political side of, you know, should we criminalize or not, but there's such a human nature, uh, a human component, excuse me, to this that I'm trying to share with people to, to, to take just one minute to, to slow down the judgment sometimes and look and see that addiction comes from somebody who's in pain, some kind of injury, emotional injury led someone yes. to try to fill the void, whether it was staring 40 in the face, whether it was home stress is whatever it was. It's unique to every person. Okay. Yes. There are themes, but yes. unique to every person. And that's what sets it in motion. So just as we wouldn't penalize somebody who has an obesity issue and has health problems because they overate, or someone who was speeding down the highway one day and has an auto accident, it's kind of a similar analogy. It's just yes. addiction is is it, it's a it's a, it's savage. That's the word I use. I mean it it, it is because it, it tears family apart apart. Um, yeah, I think you can see I have a passion for this. Yes, yes, um, but it, and it's and it's so insidious. It just creeps everywhere, and you know, everyone you probably um, whoever you speak to knows someone or has someone in their family who's um, addicted to something. Um, in this society as well, and it's become quite a normal thing on, on, on many levels where people go out and drink, for example. Like alcohol has become a normal thing, um, which, is, which is also sad in a way that um, we've, we've reached a point where we can't speak and we can't, we can't like share our feelings enough or we can't like be honest with ourselves and with each other to say, you know what, this is why I'm hurting Let's talk about this so I don't have to go and, you know, hide under alcohol or drugs. So what you're doing is really, really uh, a beautiful thing. Um, I just want to, before we go into what you're doing, so let's just leave that and, and leave a little bit of a, um, a tidbit there. So you have to listen till the end, people. I just want to ask Kevin another question. Um, what happened, what was it, Kevin, that that eventually, um, what happened to you that eventually made you change? Like, I mean, you look at you, you're looking good. You, um, you know, you, you don't look like, I couldn't say that like two years ago, whenever it was that you were a meth addict, right? What happened to change I everything? I, I'll tell you what, what, what happened was I had a psychotic break where I believed that some things were happening that weren't happening. I'll leave it at that. And I tried to kill myself. And it was sincere. Fortunately, I survived, obviously. Yes, uh, yes. But that, the power of that drug had me believing certain things that were just not accurate. But mm -hmm. I was hoping, seeing things, weaving together a, a very, very disturbing narrative. Um, and because of my social conscious desire to, to, to do good, I didn't want my parents to have to see me incarcerated which is what I believed was going to happen, which was inaccurate. But in that moment, that's what I thought. Um, and again, the, the evil of that drug, you know, I'll, I'll share one example because I'm trying to be very real with people. Mm. To keep things simple, when I had this view that someone was out to get, okay, and that's what methamphetamine tends to cause, okay? Yes. Yes. Um, I was writing email, and I don't know if many of your viewers, I'm sure, have Gmail. Okay. Yes, most when people. There's a certain sense with Gmail, okay, that makes the drafts save more frequently than they used to. I don't know every mechanism to it, but I, there were some changes I think made to the settings with Gmail. Bottom line, I was writing email and I was seeing my settings or my drafts save more frequently. 
And I believed in that moment that someone had tapped into my laptop, okay? And I saw across the screen 32 months. Uh, And I felt like it was somebody messing with my head saying, you're going to jail for 32 months, okay? Um, I mean, what it does to your mind. So it was after that, after I I tried to kill myself, that I realized, you know, Kevin, it's time to, to, to really look in the mirror, fortunately. I did, and here I am. Well, that, that's that's a good thing. But, um, I, and I also, and I'm going to throw a bit of a, 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 a just like something in the works here. Um, how, if you look back, how in some weird way this um, this myth uh, addiction that you had was actually a blessing, because. If you didn't have that uh, meth addiction, right, and you didn't go through all this horror and pain, and I'm not saying addiction is a good thing at on any level, right? It's 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 very difficult to to um, to maintain. It's I mean to maintain. It's ridiculous. It's very difficult to get out of, and it's 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 easy to just get caught up in the, this web, right? But in some weird way, it was a blessing for you um, because it brought you to this point. So if you hadn't had that um, that addiction and you hadn't got out of it and been brave enough and strong enough and and loved yourself enough to get out of it, we wouldn't be having this conversation, and you wouldn't have met Dino Miliotis and Brandon Foss and created this beautiful um, foundation that we are going to speak to uh, speak about now. Um, so, what are your thoughts about that? So um, my last name is Hire, H-Y-E-R, and I feel like my higher calling, H-I-G-H-E-R, is to talk about hard drug addiction and break those stereotypes that reinforce the stigma, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you fit a stereotype, you you internalize it, okay? You're just a junkie, you know? You're you're just a tweaker on a trailer park, you know? You internalize it. Exactly. And if you don't fit it, Okay, I'm just being again, I'm being real. Yes, you, yes. You may not think you have a problem when you do. And I fell into that trap. Now, I was a lawyer in a big city. Well, a lawyer in a big city can have a problem with methamphetamine as much as somebody in rural Missouri. Okay. Yes, so I am like telling this story and I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of new at this. So I'm, I'm learning to open up more and more um, to, to, to tell the truth. You know, how this happened. You know, I was this goody goody overachiever from the suburbs, um, you know, who in a moment, decision set altered the course of my life and my family's life Mm -hmm. um and by the grace of my higher power um i survived it you know i I survived that suicide attempt and here i am with a foundation the higher calling foundation um where i draw on my my talents as an employment attorney to help people in recovery get back on their feet professionally and what we do is we provide services that insurance does not traditionally cover Okay. Mm-hmm. We do job placement. We help people with personal presentation, um, which would be, you know, interview preparation, discussion on how to artfully talk about addiction, uh, prior criminal issues, if you have any, um, you know, reviewing resumes will help people with legal fees if they have attorneys that they need to work with, you know, because you can't put your life back together when things are falling apart at the seams. Yes. And what yes. I'm proud of is, although there are eligibility requirements for certain services, we charge nothing. We charge nothing. And we will turn no one away from the sense of, I will try to help you as much as I can. Again, there are eligibility requirements for certain things. But we want to take every person that comes to us and say, look, how can we help you have a second chance? Because when you have something to live for, and employment's certainly up there, you're less likely to relapse. And that's yes. what we're trying. Yes. yes. I do I- feel very strongly that... Um, you know, my, I was had the good fortune, my last name plays into it, that this is my higher calling to go out there and talk about this so that people can realize it's not quite so, addiction's awful, but you can overcome it. Yes. So you have to tone down a little bit of the judgment and the rhetoric around it so we can talk about it and then help someone get back on, back on their game and move forward. And that's our, our message. Yes, yes. And I love that um, because that's what we need. We need to break those stereotypes because, uh, and the fear, because we talk, I mean, this is break fear and and addiction. There is so much fear around addiction, not only for the addict. I mean, that's what started it in the first place, right? But also for the family and the friends, they have to sit and watch and be and totally 
hopeless, helpless, and powerless. It's it's very very hard for them as well. So, are you do you have like um, a do you support the families as well? Yes, we do. We we will really reach out. To, we will help anyone who reaches out to us in good faith, who's been touched by addiction or mental illness and is trying to put their lives back together. You know, we're supported entirely by donations. You know, we ask people if you have a few dollars and you're willing to help us out, we certainly are incredibly appreciative. But even if you don't have the money to help us financially, you can help us with your time. You know, one of the initiatives I'm most proud of, one of our my signature initiatives, is our time donation, where we say to people. This is an all hands on board effort. You know, yes. you, you can chip in in every way you can. So if you live in a certain area and you have a certain profession, you might be able to serve as a resource for somebody who's trying to rebuild their, their network. Because again, mm-hmm. it's being real with people, you know, these things get damaged in active addiction. And you need a second chance. You need a fresh start. And somebody to give you advice maybe on how to approach your job search because they know their area, they know their profession, you know. Um, you know, and again, we, we vet people. So it's, there, there are mechanisms in place to make sure it's handled appropriately. But yes, yes. we are just trying to go out there and tell this story, um, you know, of how I, you know, as a lawyer who fit no stereotype of meth became in a sense, a face of meth addiction, okay? Um, and it can be overcome and you can get back on your your your, your wagon, back get back on the wagon and move forward. Um, and I'm trying to help people professionally. And that's what our foundation does. I love this. And um, like I said before, it's a, it's a beautiful initiative. Um, and and you, you can just see it with one, one as you as you help one person because obviously you help one person um an addict that helps the family in in an, in indirectly and it helps the community the and it's so just the ripple effect is beautiful um so i have to say um i i take my hat off to you and again i'm going to say it's amazing how the universe god works in such mysterious ways um, and how things just happen and in such a beautiful way to just open up the universe, right? And helping up the world. Well, that's what recovery really does. I mean, and there's not one way to do recovery, but so- sobriety is a lifestyle as much as it is not using the substance. Clearly that's, that's the essence of it, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yes. And, you know, 12-step programs, they help you get in touch with your higher power, you know, mm-hmm. living life on life's terms, learning to give your, your your will up to God, and you try to, to live your life the way your higher power, however you conceive them, however you understand them, wants you, you to carry on, yes, you know, yes. I say, you know, I meditate in the morning, and I pray at night, pray, when I pray, again, it's to however I perceive my higher power, that's when I talk to them, meditation is when they talk to me. Yes, you know, yes. and I, that's why I feel strongly that this is a story that needs to be told. Um, because part of why we're also telling this story is when I was in active addiction, um, I had allowed some people to be interns for our foundation. Um, I was receiving nothing back in terms of any kind of tangible or intangible benefit other than trying to help people. And again, having been my mm-hmm. attorney, I had some insight into that. Yes, and we yes. were the target of an extortion attempt. And um, that extortion attempt was when these young men went to the police and said that I was distributing methamphetamine to younger men and they were getting addicted and then wanted to demand money in exchange to not testify. Now, fortunately, we got ahead of that. But part of telling that story, it's it's a powerful story, is to break those two. To say, I have many flaws and I was addicted to methamphetamine, but here I was trying to help street addicts. I would pay them $50 to do a writing assignment. Okay. And that's how I was spent. So we're trying to break those stereotypes yes. that just reinforce the stigma, that reinforce addiction, and try to just have a message that's positive to say, okay, it happens, especially after COVID. You know, yes. let's talk about yes. fix it and then back on with life. Yes. You know? Yes. I think um, COVID uh, just messed with a lot of people um, and, and you know, with the boredom and not having a purpose. It's also about be having purpose and meaning in life. Um, and a lot of people lose their way and they need just a hand. Say, hey, here's a hand, hand up, or here's support. Let's help you get back on track. Yes. So 
like I said, I commend you, um, Kevin. That is a beautiful, beautiful initiative. Um, and, and I think we all need to get behind that because it's not only about helping the addict, it's about helping the families, about helping the community. Um, exactly. where, where can people find you? Um, where can people find you, Kevin? And where can people find um, the Higher Calling Foundation? And where can they don donate other, I don't know, Volunteer, time, money, whatever it is. Sure. Um, our website is highercalling.org, spelled H-Y-E-R-C-A-L-L-I-N-G.org. Um, my, my professional website about my legal background is kevinhireesq.com, um, just to give people a sense of what I did prior to this. But if you go to our website, you can donate financially, you can donate with your time. We're happy to field questions from people. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to start a movement. And everyone has gifts and talents that they can contribute to that. And that's why I say, if you're not in a position to donate financially, I get it. Not everyone is, but there's something you can do because it helps families. It helps communities. It fights the war on drugs. That's yes. what we're doing yes. because you're not yes. going to need to use drugs when you feel better about yourself and you have something to live for. And exactly. employment is right up there. Yes. And insurance, yes. I'm not knocking it, but insurance doesn't does not cover when you leave rehab. All it does is if you relapse. Well, as I said in a prior one, that's not what you need. What you need is to stay sober, you know, and you need yes. that support. You need you know? the support. You oh God, yes, yes, yes. And that's what's so hard. I, I say to people, I understand pulling away from someone when you watch them making self-destructive decisions being intimidated by it, expressing disapproval. But what people need is support. What they need is support, you know, and yes, that's what we're trying yes, yes. And especially once you get your life back together enough, some of those people that were a bit hesitant with you from your past will come back around, you know, and then you can repay the favor forward. You know, that's yes. the beauty of it, yes, you know, yes. because I'm not that naive. We're always going to have drugs and alcohol. Um, and again, not that alcohol is innately evil. It's not, but not everyone's biology allows them to drink it responsibly. Yes. These issues will always be out there. Um, and it's my hope, my best hope, that the Higher Calling Foundation can help put lives and families back together. Yes, that's, I that's think that's I that's what it is as well. It's um it's 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 having it's it's having exposure enough for people to understand what it is and not be embarrassed about it or stigmatized by it so that they can come out and say, you know what, I've got this problem, help me, please help me. And with that, you know, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, eventually people can understand and we can improve society and and help change so many people's lives. So well, that's why I say it, 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 you wouldn't, you wouldn't, somebody was speeding down the highway and has an auto accident. That wouldn't be seen as any judgment against them if they had injuries. People would rally around it, but they made a mistake. And I'm not knocking it, but I'm drawing an analogy. Okay. Yes. If somebody's unhealthy and they have health issues from that, we wouldn't see it in the same way. That's what addiction is. It's a disease. It came from an initial bad decision. There's so good people. There's the humanity, and and in, perhaps in another episode, I can talk to you more about some of what I observed in in the in the the drug culture. You can still see light and darkness, okay? And yes. and those people are doing the best that they can. I'm not I'm not rationalizing behavior or, or selling drugs or illegal behavior, but we all come from our own place of quiet desperation, and that's never more true than in active addiction. Yes. Yes. Yes, well, it's, and, and again, it's about um, exposure, having, seeing it, understanding it, and then making your own decision, right, without yeah. the stereotypes and without your own fear. Wow, this has been awesome. And yes, we, I think we will have to have another episode just talking about the, 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 the underground um, cultural movement, um, like drug movement and how um, we as people can make a difference in just helping and loving someone, um, which is difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. It's difficult to, to love an addict when they're so erratic and paranoid and all those things, but it's about understanding and education. Well, that's, that's, that's some of the heartbreaking nature of addiction is the fact that it does put such a it, it, it just creates such fracture in families, you know. Yes. Um, so, you know, when you hear police officers or someone say, you know, selling drugs, you know, is tearing apart families and communities, they're right. Because addiction doesn't just hurt the person involved. 
you know, clearly they're the one at the, in the moment, but the families, their loved ones, employers, the lost productivity, drug, drug abuse and, and irresponsible alcohol use affects everybody, affects communities. Yes, you know, yes, yes. And, and again, that the stigma and the judgment reinforces it because you're afraid to try to get help when you know you need it. And I knew I needed it for a while. And then it drives people into these dysfunctional subcultures where they're watching out for each other because they've been rejected by the mainstream culture. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I remember somebody once saying to me when I was referring to trying to get clean, oh, but such a sense of community. Well, there is for inactive addiction with, with methamphetamine that I observed, but there's such a healthier sense of community and recovery, you know, yes. but they're doing that because that's what's been forced upon them. And again, we wouldn't do this with other diseases that reflect poor lifestyle choices, you know? Yes, yes, And, yes. and again, what I can say, yes, you're talking to someone who had a drug problem, but I got over it and I'm moving forward and my life's good again, you know? That's what we're trying to say. It's when you make it seem so scary and intimidating that you can't talk about it, just reinforces it. And yes. it hurts it. Yes, so. and, and I think also um, people within that subculture, they, they're so caught up in that subculture that they think it's normal and they don't know any better as well. Um, well so, so you get that as well. Well, you get stuck because you, you get to a point where I mean, decisions have such a ripple effect. And before you know it, you spent years in those settings. And again, drugs change your mind. You know, <laughs> the, 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 well, what they change is the chemical composition or your of your brain. I'm not a scientist, but yeah, it, it's the neural pathways. You know, it, yes. it's, it, it's bad, bad stuff. So we're out there trying to do our part. Thank you so much, Kevin. This has been awesome. So um, the Higher Caller Foundation, we will have all the details are in the description box and um, reach out, support the Higher Caller Foundation. It's, it's a beautiful initiative and there's, it'll just cause a ripple effect and we can just love, go out and just help, you know, one little step, one little step and we can change society for the better with just um, some time. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Karina. Have an awesome day. You too. Bye, everyone.